Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Pace Setters. Well, this is episode three, Time Flies When You're Having Fun. We started with Will Rickson. Last week, we had Alan Bartley. And this week, we've got an even greater guest for you. Welcome to the show, Stephanie Lippiat. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh, it's fantastic to have you on. Now, if we think about your episode three, let's say we've got entree, main meal, dessert. Which one are you, Steph? Which one would you be in that, in that little, that little uh, compilation? I- I'd have to say I was dessert. Everybody holds out for dessert, so I'd have to say that. <laughs> dessert, sweet tooth, sweet tooth, or sweet in the middle. <laughs> Either way. <laughs> hey, how's things going? You, you, you know, you, you obviously you're driving some winners here, there, and everywhere. You, you're training some winners. Things seem to be going all right this season. Uh yeah, not too bad, not too bad. Um, started out pretty good, and then uh, we just kind of uh, put a few horses out and you know, for spells and freshen ups and whatever. Uh, so it died off a little bit there, but I'm um, just starting to pick back up now. So, yeah, it's been pretty good. I take whatever I can. Yeah. And what do you – have you got races in mind, like, on the horizon that you're setting yourself for? Um, not particularly. You know, the horses that I've got, they're just kind of a bit like bread and butter horses. You know, they try their best every week, and um, I just try to find the cheapest races I can for those sort of horses. Um but um, I'm always looking forward to the next race, regardless of whether it's just a uh, country race or, you know, hopefully one day, you know, a big group one race would be great. Yeah. You're one of those drivers that seems to pop up a lot where you, when you land a winner, they seem to have a bit of a price on them. <laughs> <laughs> What's that all about? I don't know. Uh, I guess, you know, the sort of horses that I just said I drive, they're not the best horses in the race. Um I'm used to driving horses like that, so I, I get used to trying to find all the shortcuts and every now and then it works out and they've just got that big price tag. The pun is pal. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes not. <laughs> what, um, is, that, is that something that you really thrive on, trying to get the best out of, a, out of a horse and really extract the best that it can possibly get for you on the track on race day? Oh, definitely. You know, um, don't get me wrong, I definitely put in a few uh, – ordinary drives just like anybody else and um especially you know if the horse has been traveling well and you've been racing it you know week in week out and then uh you get a little bit excited because it's been going well and you don't put it in the best spot in the race but um i'm always trying to get the best out of every horse that i drive okay so all right let, let's let's start let's go way way back steph how'd you first come to be part of the harness racing industry uh, we can blame Dave Morris for that, actually. I uh, I didn't know anything about harness racing. I, I've always been a horse girl, and uh, I couldn't have told you how to gear up a horse if my life depended on it. And um, I met Dave and just went to work with him a few times and just fell in love with it over time, and you can't pull me away now. So when, when you say you met Dave, we're talking about um, <laughs> your partner, David Morris, who's yeah. obviously well-known in in uh, in the harness racing scene an excellent driver and drives a lot of the horses that you train um so when you say you met him run us through the Uh, the scenario what's happened (laughs) i was still uh high school um and i uh, actually i snuck out and um uh i wouldn't condone this but you know underage steph wasn't uh as um law-abiding as grown-up Steph. Uh, I met Dave <laughs> on a night out and, um, yeah, so I was maybe 17, I'd say, you know, and uh, Dave was only 19 then. Um, we've been together for 10 years now. Um, we've seen a lot of highs and a lot of lows together, so that's, you know, that's always something to appreciate in the long run. Um, yeah, so, yeah, just <laughs> I guess that's how I met Dave and then um, just – Got used to hanging out with him on the weekends, you know, at the stables and stuff. And uh, the first time I ever actually jogged a horse, I told him I was never going to be in that sport. The rocks hurt me too much. Um, and maybe three weeks went by and I was like, oh, do you mind if I give it another go? And, yeah, I haven't I haven't been out of the sulky since. <laughs> when you said you wanted to give it another go, was that because was that you really wanted to do it or were you trying to impress him, Steph? What was going on? <laughs> Uh, a bit of both. I think I was sick of gearing up and shoveling poo, so I just said, uh, let me back in the sulky. Uh, just try to, uh, you know, be one of those drivers that gets in, gets out, <laughs> instead of doing all the hard work. Uh, so, when, so when you met him, um, obviously the Morris family are entrenched in the harness racing industry and, 
and uh, and have been forever and a day. Um, did you know what you were getting yourself into when you when you when you met him and you decided that uh, you might start keeping company a little bit more regularly? Yeah, absolutely not. I had no idea what it was like. What the you know the whole family is involved. It's not just Dave. You know, it's his cousins and his uncles and just like everybody and. The industry is so like close knit. At the start, I actually thought Dave was like related to a lot more people than he is because he calls everybody Uncle This or you know Poppy That. And I'm like, man, how many relatives do you have in this? <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so I wasn't sure. Like, I didn't know how full on it was going to be. I suppose um, I used to go with Dave everywhere. You know, when he was when I first met Dave, he was a junior driver and. He was thriving and, you know, it was Newcastle and Penrith and Goulburn and Canberra and it just, it never stopped. So, um, yeah, I definitely, it was a wake-up call realising, like, you know, the time that he put aside for me considering how much effort it was just to be doing his job. Mm. So to go from being a 17-year-old who's never been, never been around the sport, never had anything to do with it to, you know, we're only talking, we're talking less than a decade or so now, aren't we? You know, a decade where you you now are on top 10 leaderboards for drivers, driving results, premiership results. Um, that's a significant climb and, and progression through the ranks, Steph. You must be really proud of that. I am. I definitely am. Um, don't get me wrong. Every now and then I catch myself getting a bit down and then, uh, you know, I think, like, you've done a lot. You've really done a lot from where, you know, you didn't grow up in it. You didn't know... You wouldn't know how to tell a favourite from a hundred to one shot. You would have picked it on how pretty it was in the parade ring, you know, just stuff like that. So um, when I, yeah, when I am feeling a bit down, actually, Dave's usually the first one to say to me, "Hey, you know, you've you've done really well." Mm. Yeah, so I am. Well, great. Well, so what's been the key learning? Like, obviously, you pick up key learnings when you're so influential in those early stages. What were some of those key learnings that you picked up? Do you think have helped you, you know, get to where you are now? Um. I guess probably the biggest one and the one that I try to remember a lot because I'm really bad for uh, just, you know, like getting down on myself is um, that there's going to be another race meeting, you know. If you've put in a bad drive, there's the, just worry about the next race. And uh, when you're in that sort of mindset, if you have put in a bad race or the horse hasn't gone as well as you thought, you know, it is hard to think forward about what you'll um, – you know what you'll do in the next race you kind of try not to dwell too much on what's happened but um i just try to think you know like even the best drivers make mistakes every now and then so just look forward to the next drive yeah so so beth you said about three weeks ago and by when you when you thought you'd, you'd give it another go at working working with the horses so after that three weeks and you you probably had a little bit of a breakthrough. At what point did it start to go, do you actually really like this and, and I want in in a, in a much bigger way and I want to be invested in this uh, properly? How long did that take? It really probably didn't take all as long as I thought. Um, the stable that we were working at at the time um, put me on a few horses uh, at the trials and it was only like Fairfield trials, you know, but there was like six or seven other people there and, just the adrenaline that you get from even just going around in the trials, I just thought, yeah, I love this. This is this is what I want to do. How far removed is it from what you wanted to do? When every kid, every kid and teenager just got that sort of in the back of their mind, what they think life starts to look like when you go out and get a real job. Yeah. So um, how far is this to what that looked like? Actually, um, I wanted to uh, study veterinary science. Um, so we always joke, you know, that I could have had like a, a way more like successful and uh, better paying job um, and Dave ruined that for me. So he'll like to hear that. Um, but uh, no, I, I wouldn't, I can't dream of doing anything like different, even though I thought I wanted to do that, you know, be the vet science, like do the veterinary science. Um, it's just, it's just such a big thrill, you know, to be out on the track and I'm racing against some of the best drivers and trainers that there are you know like just the current pool of drivers is incredible it's 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 really yeah. like humbling sometimes to be out yeah. there well look you know vet science is, is working with animals and working with horses you know so so maybe it's not that far removed from what what it possibly could have been steph but um maybe the bank balance is a little, <laughs> is a little bit different Definitely. but um you know, you guys have set up a beautiful life for yourself, Dave. You got a you got a beautiful little family. You got two little boys. Um, what's uh, 
what, what's a normal day look like in your uh, household? <laughs> um, normal day would probably be trying to wrestle the youngest one. He's a uh, he's whirlwind. He will never have any trouble in his life deciding what he wants to do because he definitely has a strong will. Uh, but, no, it's not too bad. Um, Dave spends most of his day at home when he's not at the races. He um, is a stay-at-home dad besides racing. Um, he loves that. He uh, he prefers it that way. And I um, go out to work in the mornings. Um, sometimes Riley will come out with me, especially now that we're in some sort of semi-lockdown. He has his pony out at the stables, so he's really enjoying get to, getting to go out and work his ponies. Um, his horse, Mad, the eldest one, Riley, and Cody, our youngest, uh, he yeah, he would just he doesn't care about horses at all. <laughs> so they're chalk and cheese. Um, currently, Dave has taken the boys for a big walk because um, otherwise you wouldn't hear me on this. So <laughs> our house bit, of a, is- bit of a crazy household, is it? <laughs> yes, quite. Yeah. A, uh, but full of fun. We always like to have fun. <laughs> Look, I, I think that's a healthy household if you've got madness, madness and chaos going around when you're raising two little boys. That's that's a sign of a good mum, Steph. How do you um, so how do you then? Obviously, the demands of being a um, being involved in the in the harness racing industry are pretty hectic, you know. And, and most trainers will tell you that it's 24 hours. It's a 24 hour job. How do you go about being a mum and that? that expectation and the and the workload that's required to be part of our industry? Um, with a lot of help. I wouldn't be able to do anything with the horses without the help that we have. Um, like I said, Dave likes to stay home, so that's, that's super helpful that he stays home with them in the morning. Uh, but when we're racing, Dave's parents usually watch them, Kim and Noel Morris. Um, we usually joke that they'll, uh, we'll just pick up their kids on our way home. They have them so often. Uh, they love their nan and pop, so it's never any trouble with them going there. But um, I don't know, sometimes, like, I'll catch myself, like I said, you know, like I dwell a bit on the races if I put in a bad race. So sometimes I catch myself thinking I'm not putting in enough, um, you know, like home time and that. And um, so I just really try to, every time that we don't have the horses doing something, you know, for instance, like today, after I get off of this, we're going to go for a bike ride. I'll just try to always be you know, putting the kids first as well. Um, yeah, and I don't. I honestly don't know how I balance it. Uh, I blink, you know, it'll be Tuesday and I blink and it's Tuesday again. So, um, yeah, just we just take it each day as it is and we're grateful. Yeah. Oh, look, I've dealt with a lot of, lot of athletes over the years across a whole heap of different sports and most of them will tell you that parenthood changes you um, from a – from an athletic perspective and, you know, and what's required of you when you put your game face on and you have to deliver on, on an outcome as far as sport goes. Is that accurate for you? Like, it, obviously, you need to switch on and be in work mode, which is such a high-profile sport, um, and then take that hat off and, and be a mum outside of those hours. Um, how did it change you when, you when you became a parent? Well, I, I can't really see say that it has done that for me because I actually didn't start racing until I had had Riley, my first son. Um, so, yeah, my first season was after Riley was born. Sure. Um, so I don't know what it would have been like before that to compare it. Um, but I can say, that, like, you know, like trying to find time to go through the fields and stuff like that, you know, like I'm usually staying up a bit later than I probably should at night because I've wanted to spend, you know, a couple extra hours, you know, doing something the kids want to do, whether it's painting or baking or something. So you just have to you have to find more time in the day <laughs> uh, if that's even possible, um, just staying up a bit later, I guess, and getting up a bit earlier. What about, uh, you know, I've in, in the work that I've done working with, say, cricketers, they'll, they'll say, look, you know, go out, get a, get a duck and, you know, and that's the worst thing in the world and they feel horrible. Put that in racing terms. It's probably that a, a race didn't quite go to plan or – you know, or your horse has galloped or something like that, is coming home and putting your parent hat on and, you know, you're dealing with the most remedial question or or having to worry about what, what dinner looks like or that. Is that just you completely just can remove yourself from the, you know, what went wrong on the racetrack? Uh, I try to. I definitely try to. 
Uh, we have a great saying where we say, what happens on the track stays on the track. So that's regardless of whether, you know, somebody else in the, inconvenienced you or the horse went terrible. It's the same, same thing. Whatever happens out there, it stays there. You don't bring it home with you. Um, just in general life, you have enough things to worry about without worrying about a race that's happened or a race that's going to happen. Um, so, yeah, it can be <laughs> if you're coming home, especially to my three-year-old at the moment who's a great why asker. Um, it can be quite frustrating, but I just like to, uh, I suppose delegate. So like if he asks me something that I'm like really annoyed about trying to answer for the 600th time in the evening, I'll be like, okay, well, let's do something different. (laughs) Trying to push him to a different activity instead of answering his question for the 600th time. Uh, yeah, I, like I said, I don't know how we do it, but Dave and I, we just kind of bounce off each other. And if one of us is having, you know, a bad we need a fifteen minute break or something, and just go outside the other one or take over. We need to you need to school them up. Look maybe lockdown's a perfect opportunity. School them up on how to read the form and the fields. There's one job that you won't have to do and put them on the payroll. There you go. Well, Riley's actually he's super interested in racing. He loves it. He's uh his favorite um power team at the moment is uh Jack trainer and Jason Grimson it's not mum and dad uh so every time they're in a race he wants to go through the fields and see what sort of horses they've got so um I wouldn't be surprised if he knows more about the race fields than I do (laughs) do you think a future in the industry is probably inevitable for your kids I definitely would lean to say yes Riley will definitely be there um I mean Cody he's I just I don't know he's just so strong-willed he just he loves his motorbikes and that at the moment um but Dave, as a younger kid, never had anything, like didn't want to have anything to do with the horses either. So um, you never know with kids. They just, they fall into what they want to fall into. But I'll never push it on them. But if they want to do it, I'll always be there to support them. Mm. You, you briefly touched on lockdown and parenting through that. What are, what are some of the other challenges that you guys have faced with lockdown at the moment? Because it, um, you know, it's not tough. On, it's not easy on anyone um, at the moment. What are some of the challenges you guys face? It's, you know, obviously the, the, the dual responsibility of, the harness racing industry plus the responsibilities of parenthood. Yeah, so at the moment, um, Riley's homeschool. So um, Dave tries to do as much of that as he can with him in the morning before I get home. And then I'll, uh, I'm a bit better of a reader than Dave um, and writing. So uh, I usually do that part with Riley, whereas Dave's more of the physical exercise part. Um, so we're dealing with that. Plus um, we're currently only allowed to race at Menangle and Penrith. I mean, we're, we're so fortunate that we're even racing at all, to be honest. Um, I didn't think that it would last this long. So um, hat off to um, Harness Racing for finding every possible way to safely allow us to race. Um, yeah, so I don't know. It's a bit hard at the moment. You know, Menangle trainers, they can only race. They can only have Menangle drivers on them. And there's just so many different rules that, to be honest, it's really hard to keep up with. Um, they, I just, like it, all the horses that are in my name, you know, because I'm in Camden South, most of the drivers can still drive for me. Uh, but, yeah, you just, you've just you just got to constantly be keeping safe and keeping your eye on all the updates and whatnot, just trying to do the best that we can. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it's, you know, I, I think that the way that harness racing – and most of the racing codes have been able to continue through the perils of COVID for two years is incredible. And hats off to every administrator across the country who's, who's enabled it to happen. It's, you know, it's kept a lot of people in their livelihoods and, you know, let's hope touch wood it, uh, it can continue because, you know, there's a, there's a lot of people um, are definitely employed in this industry and, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, I just can't imagine how tough it must be to have the responsibility for a stable at the same time. Is that worry hanging over your head? Um, it is, but I know, you know, if we ever do have to shut down the racing, I know the racing industry will look after us. Um, it's a great industry to be in and uh, they're so supportive. I know that they'll do everything in their power to keep us racing, but if they can't, I know that they'll help us, whether it's financially or, you know, just even with their um, Mates for Harness program that they have running um, for people to call up if they're having worries and, um, you know, need somebody to talk to. Uh, so I, I am worried about the racing, but I'm not. I feel confident in the racing industry to keep us going. 
yeah, I mean, it's in a lot better place than a lot of other, you know, people in different lines of work and that I, you know, so we can be, we can be very grateful for that. Hey, you mentioned the reading, the reading stuff before, and you might be a little bit better, better than that than, than Dave. Um, if you wanted to do vet science, you must've been pretty cluey as a kid at school. Takes a, takes a pretty good score to be able to get into a course like that. Bad. Um, I never got into like Sydney, so that would have been like, you know, that would have been a pretty great score, but I could have uh, done a course in Melbourne to get the extra points. Um, so it would have just been an extra year longer. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not too bad. <laughs> Are you saying we're smarter up here than the Victorians? Is that? Yeah, well, they give you an extra five points if you go in a state. So he can be a little bit dumber if you come from Sydney. If you go down to Melbourne. Oh, you've just created a you just created a, a border war. I think. <laughs> uh, I, I think COVID created the border war. <laughs> <laughs> you've just amplified it a little bit more, Steph. Added hey, um, so. You know, you, you said that obviously at the moment you can only really drive at Menangle and Penrith because of the way that, that lockdown's operating. But you know, you've driven at a lot of tracks across the state. You got a you got a favourite? Um, now I'm going to start a war here. Uh, I actually I really love Penrith. Um, I like Menangle. I feel like it suits some horses, not all. Um, but I really love Penrith and uh, also Goulburn. I'm a pretty big fan of Goulburn. Yeah, it's a good track, that one at Goulburn, isn't it? What is it about those ones that you like? Um, I think maybe uh, I like the half-mile tracks a bit better than, you know, the, the longer track at Menangle. Um, but just, I don't know, maybe just the atmosphere, like just the country people, and everyone's just so happy to see you. They still get a little bit of a crowd. Um, and just the club, you know, Goulburn Club itself, they, they're always just so happy for everyone to be there. Now you talked before about the, the I guess the rush of winning a race, of being on a horse, and then winning a race. Like, tell me about what what it's like to win a race for you. Uh, for me, uh, I guess it's like having dessert. <laughs> I uh, yeah, I don't know. I just when you're out there, you don't really feel that. Um, well, I personally, I don't feel the adrenaline until after the race. Um, you know, when you come in, especially if you've won, you know, and. Nine times out of ten, everybody that's in the race, you know, they're happy to see you win a race. So they'll, you know, they'll congratulate you and um, just putting in all the hours, you know, everybody in the industry, they're just putting so many hours. So just to get a little bit of a reward sometimes, I think uh, it's just, yeah, it's just great. <laughs> so when you're um, you're you're coming back, coming through the field or you're, or you're in front or whatever the scenario of the race pattern is, is there a moment when you're on that run towards the winning post, you go, I've got this, and, yeah. and you can feel it in your head. Like, just talk me through that. Because it must be, as someone who hasn't been through that experience personally, it must just feel amazing. I mean, I, I know what it's like to be standing beside and cheering on something that, I, you know, <laughs> that, I, that I've supported. But, you know, how does it feel when you're the, you're the driver and you've got people cheering and, yeah, uh, no, it's great. It's definitely great. I mean, at the moment, it's a little bit quiet at the uh, at the tracks with no uh, spectators, so it kind of feels like a trial day. But uh, when the spectators are there, uh, you know, like I've re- I've won a couple of um, of those lady invitational races on the big race days, and uh, just people like screaming at you know from the side, whether they're screaming for you or not, you take it all in as if it's your own. And, uh, yeah, definitely if you've got one that's uh, getting home quite quickly and you know that you're going to get them straight away in your head, you're like, I've got this. I, I can do this. Come on. And you start screaming at your horse. And, yeah, so, um, yes, yeah, so, I don't know. It's probably not the prettiest thing. Like I've got some photos where I, I don't look that great, but um, I, I can tell you that the joy in those photos, um, I'll put the photos up even if I look horrendous. <laughs> Is it, a, is it a bigger thrill than training the winner? Uh, I suppose, I don't know. My first winner, like my first train winner, that was a pretty good thrill, you know. And like I said, everybody congratulated me and I put in all the hard work with it. Um, but, yeah, being being the, the one to steer them over the line's probably still got to top training them. If you can train and drive them, that's probably, you know, the ultimate package. Yeah. Hey, and particularly if you were wearing the team teal silk, team teal silks like you have, you know, in the past, and you and you've you know been a great ambassador for that campaign, um, that obviously amplifies that feeling of of joy and success, doesn't it? Because you're fundraising for a great cause. Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, like you said, I love winning. 
um, regardless. But uh, if I can get, you know, some sort of um, recognition for a great cause, you know, such as a Team Teal or the Mates for Harness whilst doing that, um, that's even better. Um, you know, those sort of uh, causes, they need as much um, sponsorship as they can get. And I suppose just seeing them going over the line or in the photo, the, you know, the winning photos, it gets people's curiosity going and then they start to research what it's about. And um, hopefully I've helped, you know, add something to the campaign. Mm. I, I love that there's so many amazingly talented um, female participants in our sport who it doesn't it doesn't matter whether you're male or female on our sport. You you know, you can um, walk out on the same level playing field uh, behind that mobile barrier, and um, yeah, and it just everything's everything's level. Everyone gets to race against each other. I think it's so unique in in, in elite sport itself. Um, must be a thrill to beat the blokes, though. <laughs> it definitely is, uh, especially like you said. I usually get a long shot up, so when I do that, and the boys have got the favourite or something, you know, that's definitely bragging rights there. Uh, but yeah, there's so many, so many talented women in the industry and we're getting more every year. And um, if I could encourage more women to, you know, join or drive or train, participate, anything, I would. Um, the industry looks after its women. They've just actually introduced new maternity leave programs and stuff um, in New South Wales. Um, so that's... Uh, that's you know that's just showing you how far forward the racing industry is coming. Yeah, how often do you race against Dave? <laughs> Pretty well, much all, yeah, all the time. Yeah. So is there a tally kept on the fridge or something like that? Or <laughs> uh, usually, like a uh, loser has to buy dinner or something like that. Unless I lost, and then Dave has to buy dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I would have, I would have thought there's some sort of tally board sitting there somewhere at the house, isn't there? They're just a. Uh, yeah, um, I'm quite competitive. Uh, I'm always trying to beat Dave. If there's one person I'm definitely trying to beat in the race, it's Dave. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, we don't. You know, we we're always there for each other's success, and uh, and you know, when it's not going so well, we're also always there. So. Uh, there's no actual tally board, but uh, I like to keep a mental one, and usually I'm the winner. Yeah. I spoke to Ellen Bartley for the post series last week, and obviously her and Blake Jones are, are a couple and involved in a similar scenario to you guys. You know, you're training a lot of the horses that Dave drives, and Ellen and Blake, you know, similar scenario. And uh, I asked her this, who's the boss in that, in that scenario, trying to give him the driver? What, how does it work with you guys? Uh <laughs> I never I don't tell Dave how to drive them. Um I you know, he's the one that taught me everything, so I feel like it would be weird if I told him <laughs> how to drive them, but uh he usually he usually gets it right. Um if he doesn't then uh, he knows that he has to make his own dinner. <laughs> That's a good outcome for you. <laughs> yeah. I agree right. Yeah. And and just on your your training philosophy, so when you know you've got a you've got a set of horse for a race, what um, are you mapping out a plan? How many weeks, like, or is it a week to week thing? And 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 how do you know that you've got that horse right and ready to go for that particular race? Oh, that's a pretty hard question. You know, every horse is a bit different. Um, I I personally just you know, if it's for a big race, I like to make sure that you know have them fit enough. I feel like having them fit is uh, key, um, and then. You know, with like a few, like a week or so before, I just like to keep them a bit fresh as well. So we try, if it's for a big race, you know, try and get them as fit as we can leading up to the race and then just back off a little bit before. Um, but in saying that, you know, every horse is different. Dave does a lot of my uh, track work. Um, if we're like going to get a horse ready for a big race, uh, you know, I want Dave's opinion. Uh, so really it's all Dave's fault if they don't go any good. <laughs> <laughs> it's intuition though isn't it it's gut feel and it's i guess it's just a bit of a hunch a bit of, yeah. bit of guesswork pretty much um yeah i don't there's no key you know, everybody trains it differently and you know everybody can still get a winner so uh i don't know yeah it's just um trial and error i suppose depends on what sort of horse you've got and uh 
where they're at in their racing, you know, whether they need to have a few weeks off before coming back in to get ready for a race or just, yeah, little things like that. So so given that it's gut feel, intuition, instinct, all those type of, you know, buzzwords, I guess, do you feel like that came fairly naturally to you as someone who sort of <laughs> was a, is a fairly recent entrant into this sport? Uh I suppose, but, you know, a lot of, like what I just said, a lot of it's from Dave's opinion, you know. I, I rate Dave's opinion at the highest that I can and um, if he tells me, you know, it needs a bit of harder work, I'll give it some harder work, you know. I won't, I won't question him about that. Yeah. They're, they're, and they're probably things that you two will then pass down the line if the two boys, <laughs> if your boys want to get into the industry too. Like they, they'll be... Yeah, they'll be coming from a pretty good place if they've got you and Dave as, as educators coming through this through the system. Yeah, I'd like to think so, you know. And uh, like I said, with um, you know, hoping that uh, Jack Trainer and Jason Grimson are still around when uh, when Riley decides to come up the ranks because he uh, he just adores them and um, they're actually they they love Riley. You know, they'll they'll go out of their way to work um, you know, work a horse with him on the jog track. You know, they'll take their big horse down and he follows them around on his little mini trotter. Um, so, you know, you always got people in the industry that are going to look after the younger generation coming through. So I think that's uh, that's really that's really key, you know, not just mum and dad, but, you know, to have other people in the industry look after your kids as well. Yeah, that is a really cool thing, I think, about the harness racing you know, conglomerate is that people really do look after each other and look out for the next generation coming through. And, you know, the Mini Trots program's a, a great program that brings brings the the nippers through. And, and uh, yeah, it's a great opportunity to, to perpetuate the industry, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Um, we love the Mini Trotters. Uh, Riley's a part of Menangle Mini Trotting Club. Um, currently it's not going because of COVID, but... Uh, it just helps them build the foundation. They get used to seeing everyone at the races. They form connections with people that they probably wouldn't if they didn't get to go to the races. You know, like I said, like they get to see, Riley gets to see Jack and Grimo, you know, all the time because they're at the training facility. But if they weren't, he would only see them at the races. And it's just something so inspiring for a young kid to actually be at the races and see their you know, their hero drivers going around in the parade ring and then watching them on the track and getting to see them after the race that, you know, that really helps Riley continue. Instead of just going and working his pony by himself, he gets to, you know, he's like, I want to be like them, you know. Yeah, I think there's an accessibility in harness racing that a lot of sports don't provide and that's a, that's a really cool thing and long may I continue. Hey, well, they're doing mini trotters. They're working horses. You did a bit of netball when you were a kid, so... I bet you didn't think that you were going to end up being, <laughs> being in the harness <laughs> racing industry when you're running around on the hard courts. Uh, no, that's right. I, I used to play a little bit at school and um, I actually I broke my ankle, well, yeah, my ankle and part of my foot playing. So, I was, I was like I said, I was quite competitive. <laughs> uh, but then uh, I didn't play for a while and then we started playing with some of the girls from harness racing just as a bit of an outlet. Um, it's always good to have something else to do with, you know, not just the horses. You've got to take time. If Even if, you've, you know, you're a family, you know, you still have to set time aside to do something that isn't horse-related, just something for yourself. So, yeah, we used to play a little bit with the girls and, uh, yeah, we all used to get a little bit aggressive. <laughs> who's, who's in this team? Talk me through the team, Steph. What do we got? Uh, well, it was a little while ago now, obviously, like COVID and everything, um, but we used to have uh, Lauren Tritton used to play, I used to play, we used to have Michelle Tracy, uh, Grace Benella used to play with us. Um, we used to have Kerry Ann at one stage, and I think we had Alicia Bond. So is that what was that long ago? Good squad. That's but, a good squad. Yeah, we used to uh, we used to just change it up. You know, if one of us girls couldn't make it, we'd always have another girl that was in the industry that would fill in for us for the you know for the week or whatever. But yeah, just but you can imagine like. You know, we're all pretty aggressive on the racetrack as it is. Like Karen, <laughs> Lauren, Lauren Pinella, um, all pretty aggressive. So we took that to the netball courts. And what, and, and what bib are you wearing? What are you, you run around in the centres, wing attack? What? Are, what? Are you... um, I was actually goal defence, which is pretty funny because I'm not very tall. So. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Short straw? Did you give it back yeah. at, at the end? Yeah. At least I wasn't goalie because I can't get it in there to save my life. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it sounds like a good team. I reckon it probably would have played pretty hard when the game's finished too. So um, that's what I like about the racing industry as well. It sticks together. People people make good friends and, you know, and, and that and that just continues, doesn't it? It rolls on. Um, it's a great industry for that, for friendship. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, like we're all out in the track trying to compete for the same money, but um, once we're off the track, you know, it's all. It doesn't matter what happens on the track. You try to just bury it. Like I said, what what happens on the track gets left on the track, and uh, yeah, we're all we're all good mates. We all look out out for each other as much as we can. And if anybody needs any help, you know, we're, we're there. You don't have to ask twice. That's an excellent outlook. I think there's something in that for all of us. It's probably a good way to end it up, actually, and to wrap it up. And Steph, thanks for your time. Uh, fantastic to be able to peel back a few of the layers on your life and, and the way you think about it. You know, you deep thinker around the industry, but don't take it too seriously. But you've know, got a lot of responsibility there, you know, whether it be at home or with your stable. So you're doing great things. Congratulations on that. Let's hope it continues. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And yeah, I hope it continues as well. Yeah. <laughs> Good on you. And best best wishes at home. Let's hope lockdown doesn't last too long and we can see you on more than just a Menangle and the Penrith tracks. So uh, everyone out there watching and tuning in, thanks for your support. Uh, it's really good fun to bring you the Pace Setter series where we profile some of the leading trainers and drivers and the other people who are just contributing great things to our industry. Um, hopefully, we'll catch you next week for Episode 4 of Pace Setters. See you then. Bye-bye.